Today we want to make the CPU run. For that we need a system clock. Traditionally the clock is generated by an external clock circuit, but in most modern microcontrollers there is actually an on-chip oscillator and the EZ80 is no exception to that. So you only have to provide a crystal and a few external components and you should get your clock. What's important however is that this resistor here which limits the current through the crystal is not included in the on-chip oscillator for the EZ80. Some other chips like the AVR microcontrollers don't need that resistor because it is already included in the chip. Now for the value of the crystal the EZ80 can go up to 50 megahertz, but I will be using a 4 megahertz crystal. That's because later we can internally multiply the clock frequency using the phase locked loop that's on the chip. And this allows us to keep the frequency low for experimenting with external components and on a breadboard. You wouldn't want to do 50 megahertz on a breadboard because, well, it's a bit too much, but 4 megahertz is perfectly fine. So we can later use this to multiply the oscillator frequency by a number, let's say we multiply it by 10, so we have 40 megahertz, or let's say we use 12, so we have 48 megahertz, which is pretty close to the maximum of 50 megahertz. And we can do all that in software and only increase the clock frequency if we actually need more processing power. So this is the crystal, 4 MHz in a small package like this, and it goes into the board right next to the oscillator pins on the chip. And you can see that I also separate the ground plane to, well, to make it more robust and isolate it from the rest of the circuit. Once the crystal is soldered in place, you add the capacitors, just like we did last time. First one side, then you turn around and solder the other side, and if necessary, you can also use flux and reflow both sides until they look nice, like I'm doing it here. Now for the resistor. Unfortunately, I forgot to include it in the PCB layout, and that's why it has to be botched in there between the pins of the crystal and it's a bit tricky since there are no pads. Also I couldn't find a 100k resistor when I was doing this so I'm trying it with 22k and let's see if the circuit still works with this lower value resistor. Okay, I've now turned on the power and no magic smoke escapes, so let's check the supply voltages. This is 5.5 volts from the power supply and it gets regulated down to 3.3 volts. So that looks fine. Now let's check the clock output. I have connected the ground of my oscilloscope to the board and I'm now probing the test pair that I made here which should have the clock output signal on it. So now comes the moment of truth. Do we have a clock signal? Yes, we have one. So now let's check if the frequency is correct. So let me find the frequency counter in the oscilloscope. And the frequency is... What? It's 11.7282. Two megahertz. No, that that's not right. We we put in there a four megahertz crystal. So what the hell is going on? So the problem here seems to be that with 22k in parallel instead of 100k, the drive current is too low, and the crystal is not resonating at its fundamental frequency. but instead we're getting an overtone at roughly three times the intended frequency. So how can I fix that problem? 
Removing the resistor is not an option because without the resistor the oscillator won't be able to start in the first place and the only option left is to find a 100k resistor. And here it is, the tiniest component that I ever soldered onto something in my life. It's that tiny black little thing at the lower end of the green wire that is a 100k resistor that I salvaged from a broken ebook reader. And let's see if it works now. And we're getting spot on 4 megahertz. So this is working now. Let's see if the CPU is actually doing something now. Even though there's no program in there yet, we should still get some activity on the address bus. From the factory, the flash ROM comes filled with all bits set. This corresponds to a restart instruction at address 3.8. So the CPU is stuck in one place executing the same instruction over and over again. But the restart instruction also pushes a value on the stack and counts down the stack pointer. And that's what you see on the address bus. When you go down from the most significant bit, you can see shorter and shorter pulses. So that's a counter. So what you can see on the address bus is how the CPU is trying to push a value onto the stack, while the stack pointer just wraps around the entire memory range all the time. Next time we will use the debug interface of the chip to modify the memory contents and make the CPU execute a meaningful program instead. Until then, thanks for watching this video and goodbye.